Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, today's lecture will be also about um, oscillations and in this particular case we will talk about oscillations of the rope just a regular rope. Now, um, why? We are talking about light, right? Well, here is the reason. I would like to introduce the concept of energy gradually. Energy of light, I mean. And considering the light is oscillation, I started with simple oscillations. Previous lecture was about oscillation of a, a spring, and what are the kinetic and potential energy, etc. Now, the oscillation of a spring are longitudinal because the parts are moving in the direction of propagation of the, wa of the waves. Light is transversal oscillations of electromagnetic field. So, before going to light, I would like to talk a little bit about simpler transversal oscillations and oscillations of the rope or oscillation of a string on the violin they are transversal which means parts are moving um, perpendicularly to the propagation of the waves now obviously whatever we are talking is a model not the reality in the reality, oscillation of the rope are very complex. And whatever I will talk about as a model of this particular motion is significantly simplified thing. So in many cases, I will assume certain things which are not exactly what the nature actually provides for us, but our approximation to the nature. So. Don't judge whatever I'm saying to, you know, strictly, because again, it's kind of a simplification, uh, primarily for educational purposes. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens, presented on unizor.com. And I do suggest you to watch this lecture from this website and use the website's resources. The resources are significant because every lecture contains a detail textual notes, which basically are like a textbook, I mean a chapter of the textbook for this particular lecture. So every lecture has corresponding chapter right next to it on the screen whenever you go to unizor.com. Mm, the, the website is totally free, there are no strings attached, there are no advertisement. Um, so even sign in is optional basically. Um, the only purpose for signing in is to create new educational material, which is the purpose of the teacher actually rather than the student. Um, and there are exams which you can take as many times as you want. I do suggest you to take it as many times as it requires to get the perfect score. And now back to oscillation of the rope. So, <clears throat> as I was saying, the rope oscillations represent transversal oscillations, which is much closer to light oscillations of the electromagnetic field than the previous lecture, which was dedicated to spring oscillations. There is a Hooke's law with the spring. There is no exact equivalent whenever you are doing this oscillation of the rope or any transversal oscillation. We really have to devise some kind of a um, correspondence between the position and the forces to apply them to something like the second Newton's law. And that's exactly what we are going to do. So we will examine the forces which are acting on each element of the rope as it um, oscillates. And then we will basically use the second Newton's law to create certain equation, the wave equation, um, which would be the end of this particular lecture. So I will try to examine 
the movements of every part, uh, every particle, every part of the rope, and I will create certain differential equation which describes this particular movement and obviously suggest a solution to this and obviously the solution will be sinusoidal oscillations um, but you will see basically all right so the model which i'm using is the following so you have a rope and let's say it's fixed on very far end far enough not to take it into consideration but this and on, on, on my side, I will just move up and down in a sinusoidal kind of movement. So the deviation from the middle point, from the neutral position, would be described as something like this. So at moment t is equal to zero, I will have Z um, sign of zero is zero, so it will be in a neutral position. Now, then, as t is growing, I will go up to the maximum level of a when sine is equal to uh, one, and then move back, back to the neutral position and to the negative a. So that's how it will go from plus a to minus a in this particular fashion. Again, this is my personal choice, how I oscillate this end of the rope. Some other people might do the same, uh, different thing, but uh, in, in my case I've decided to do it this way. Why? Well, because it's closer representing whatever the nature actually is whenever somebody is doing exactly like this. So it's kind of a close to whatever the reality is. Now, rope is basically a contiguous curve, right? And um, it's kind of difficult to deal with this. So um, obviously I will divide it into real in, into really small pieces, connect it between themselves. So consider this to be like a necklace, basically. So you have pieces, this, 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 this. So and these are links between these pieces. So this is, again, it's a model. Why? Because it's easier to describe whatever the forces are acting as forces acting on individual piece. Now, in more mathematical um, lingo, obviously that would be differential of the length of the rope. And I will definitely go to there after I will examine the forces which are acting. So, one piece of the rope is going up and down, and I would like to examine the forces. Okay. So, let's start from the very, very beginning. So, if this is something like a neutral position, and the rope is stretched. And, by the way, we're talking about only movements which are caused by my movement of the end of the rope no gravitation, no other forces involved, etc. Again, simplification. So, so we have these first, second and the third um, pieces of necklace which we are talking about, <coughs> which represent small pieces of rope on a larger scale. So let me just in enlarge it even more. So this is one, two and three. Now, what happens when I'm lifting this thing up? So I lift this thing up into this position. What happens next? Obviously, this is a link. So this thing would pull this thing up. Something like here. And this thing, as it's moving up, will move up, move up, mo move up the next um, uh, bead on this necklace, all right? So, what happens is, if I will connect this to this, here's my first simplification. Obviously, this is longer than this, and this is longer than this. I ignore it, because everything would be eventually infinitely small, 
and the difference would be an infinitely small of a higher order. So we can do it. All right, but what's really important is, let's just consider these three beats. I'm particularly interested in this one, and I'm going to devise some kind of an equation for movement of this point. So I need two neighbors, basically. Now, next assumption. All assumptions, and not exactly the same as it's in the nature, but anyway, it's reasonable assumption. Um, assumption is that there is a tension, obviously, between these links, and I assume that the tension is exactly the same everywhere. Well, yes, I mean, if you have just one long rope, and you have it under tension, the tension at every piece is exactly the same. So every piece is moved, is not moved, it, it, it experiences um, the force to the right and the force to the left, which is basically tension, exactly the same. If you will put two, uh, some kind of uh, gadgets which measure the pressure, we will put it here and here between this point. Now these two gadgets will actually um, show exactly the same result everywhere in the rope. So I assume, again, here, that there is something like a tension of the rope. And basically this tension of the rope is the source of the movement, because this is pulling this, this one, and that's basically what tension is. This pulls this, and that's what tension is. Now, how tension is working? Well, it's working in both directions. So the tension pulls A basically down, and B, well, not down, towards B, and, 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 and the tension of this particular link is uh, pulling B towards A. They, that's what tension actually is. Same thing here. B is um, pulled towards C by the tension of this link, and C is pulled uh, to the B. So B basically, if this is a s straight line, B would experience um, the same um, force to the left as the force to the right, and it will stay in place. But in this case, we have a different situation, because this bead went up first, and then it pulls up this, and only then it pulls this one. So there is a difference between these angles. If this is alpha, and, and this is beta, Alpha is greater than beta. And that difference, actually, is the source of the movement for point B. That's very, very important to understand. The angles are not exactly the same, and that's why B moves up. Well, why? Now it's very easy to understand. Because there is a uh, force here and force here. This is tension and this is tension. Well, obviously there is a force here, which is also tension, and force here, which is also tension. And these two forces are equal to each other. However, these two are equal in absolute value, but not, uh, they're not acting against each other completely. Because what we are interested in is vertical movement. And the vertical movement in this case is T times sine alpha. And in this case, it's T sine beta, right? So if this is alpha, and this is alpha, this is T. So this is T times sine alpha. Same thing here. <coughs> if this is uh, if this is t and this is alpha, then this is t times sine, uh, I mean beta, beta, t times sine beta. And the difference between these two gives vertical movement. Now, to tell you the truth, there is a difference in horizontal movement as well. Because it's not really going up, it's going a little bit to the left, because this link has a fixed links. However, again, when we are going to infinitesimally small distances, this would be t times cosine, and this would be t times cosine, and the cosine around zero 
would be very very close to one sine is different you see sine around zero is this type of a curve right cosine around zero is this and difference between cosine and one is a difference of the second order difference between sine and and zero is the difference of the first order because they are proportional to the distance and here we have like a tangent so that's why we can ignore difference between cosines when the angle goes to uh, zero but the difference between sines we cannot ignore all right so what is the difference between sines uh, again, I will do something which mathematicians would probably have to go more rigorously, I would say, but it's definitely valid assumption, and again, it's all about infinitesimals of the higher order. Now, that difference between signs is very much difference between cosines, uh, between tangents. Why? Because tangent is sine over cosine. And the cosine, as we are just talked about, they are very, very close to 1, and we can ignore them. So the difference between these is infinitesimal of the higher order. So that's why it's a valid um, approximation. Now, what is t times tangent alpha? What is tangent of this angle? Uh, if this is a curve, and this is a curve actually. What is the tangent of the um, uh, of, uh, tangent of tangential line um, made the angle with uh, with horizontal? Well, that's actually the first derivative, if you remember, the first derivative of a function is tangent of this angle tangent between the tangential line and horizontal. Now, if these kind of calculus things are not really familiar to you, you just have to stop right now. Because whatever will follow will be uh, a lot of different calculus things, and you really have to know calculus. Either you can go to this website and take the course Mass for Teams. There is a course uh, preceding and uh, kind of prerequisite for physics for genes. So, I'm just using this as a given that the tangent of alpha is basically the first derivative of this curve. Now, we're talking about curve, obviously, because all these pieces will be infinitesimally close to each other, and that's a curve. Okay, now, since we are talking about curve, we will talk about coordinates. This is x, this is y, and this curve will be y of x. However, I will take another parameter. Why? Because this thing is moving. So it's not like a fixed function. It's a function which lives in time, and it's changing. Now, we are talking about right now derivative, derivative only by the distance by x, so it's called partial derivative, and again, that's part of the calculus which you have to know, partial derivative. So basically what I'm talking about is that this is a difference between partial derivatives of Of this, uh, of this, of this curve. Um, on the left, let's put it a little L here. Minus on the right. Or, if you wish, I can put it as partial derivative at point A and point C, because again, they are infinitely close to each other. Okay, great. <coughs> now, what is the difference 
between two values of the function very close to each other. Again, let's go back to calculus. The difference between, let's use another, another letter, between f of x plus delta x minus f of x. Now, with delta x uh, being very, very small, it's about the same as first derivative times times delta x. And whenever we are talking about infinitesimal um, delta x, that would be instead of delta, we will have d, that's differential, and here we will have differential as well. So that's assuming this differential is infinitely small, infinitesimally small. So I can actually replace difference between these two functions with derivative of this function again by, by, by dx. Now what's the derivative of the first derivative? It's the second derivative. So it will be d2 y of xt to dx squared. That's the second derivative by x times dx. Right? So this is the force which acts in upper direction. That's my FB. So it's a difference between vertical um, part of this T and vertical part of this T, which I just approximated in some way, and that's the second partial derivative uh, tension being assumed being constant right okay so we know the force right great if we know the force we can go to sir isaac newton and use his second law now second law is mass times acceleration. Acceleration in the vertical direction we are talking about only. So what is the mass? Well, we are talking about infinitesimally small piece of the rope right now. So let's forget about necklace and beads. Now we are talking about piece of the rope. Necklace was basically like to explain maybe it's better. So, obviously this is a rope and infinitely Infinitesimal, infinitesimally small piece has infinitesimally small mass, right? So instead of m, I should really put dm. Now, what is acceleration? Well, if I have a function, y, what is acceleration? Acceleration is the second derivative by time. So it's d2 y of xt by time d. Now, what is mass? Okay, mass is very much related to the length. Now, dx is the length infinitesimally small. dm is a mass of this. If I have a certain rope of certain lengths, let's say L, and it mass, its mass is m, then m divided by L is density of the mass, right? Per unit of length. So, obviously, dm is equal to mu, mu times dx. So this is density of max of, of mass. So if I will, and this is a constant for a rope. You just have the total mass, and you divide it by length, and that would be mass per unit of length, or density of mass. So mu b density, and this is related. So I can replace this with mu times dx. And this must be equal to each other. Basically, that's it. Let me wipe out this. 
and I will write this so what we have is t times second derivative of our function by x it's equal to mu times second derivative of our function by time this is the wave equation basically t is supposed to be given the tension because that's how this particular rope is initially positioned and ten tensed mu is again a constant and well we are now talking about differential equation which means we need some initial conditions okay initial conditions determine because there are many different solutions to these differential equations and again i can suggest the differential uh, the solution to this differential equation in the following form i will put y of x comma t is equal to uh, sine a i need a times sine of omega t minus k x now <coughs> why did I suggest this? well obviously because I know that this would be a solution now what I suggest you to do and I would like basically to save some time just take this, the first derivative by x the second derivative by x then the first derivative by, y, by, by t and the second derivative by t and basically compare now I will do it very quickly right now but you can read about this in the notes of this lecture so um, I'll, I'll do it as fast as I can just for um, time's sake so the first derivative by x would be it would be um, so it's dy x t by dx is equal to okay a times cosine of this thing times minus k now second derivative of y t by dx two is equal to um, minus a sine omega t minus k x minus k minus k now my <coughs> first derivative dt is equal to a times cosine omega t minus k x times omega my second derivative a times minus a sine omega t minus kx times omega square something like this right and as you see my second derivative here and second derivative here they would be very much like this one if t divided by mu, let's put it this way t divided by mu so if my t divided by mu is equal to um, <coughs> everything corresponds, basically this is k square I can just replace this with k square omega squared divided by k squared so if I have this if my omega and k are chosen in this function in such a way that they are proportional then it will be a solution so that's most important thing right now
So I have come up with many different solutions for many different A. Basically, A can be any um, a positive number, real positive number. And omega and k, again, can be in a very wide range as long as their ratio is the same as ratio between t and mu. Since t and mu are given, so we know this ratio, so we know this ratio, so we can basically, for instance, the ratio is 2. Well, I can choose this one, let's say, whatever, 3, and that would be, mm, square would be 9. So to get the ratio of 2, I need to have k square equals to 4.5, so square root of 4.5. So there are many different solutions. What exactly um, I have to satisfy to choose which one exactly. Well, that's what the initial conditions are, are, serves, uh, are, are serving. When differential equations um, are involved, you have some kind of a general solution. And I'm not really pretending that this is general solution. There are other solutions. I just suggest this one. But to choose which one exactly is a matter of sufficient number of um, initial conditions. Now, what initial condition we can know about this particular thing? Well, as I was saying, I was um, moving up and down the end. If you remember from the very beginning, the distance I'm moving as a function of t was a times sine omega t. Now, it's not an accident that I'm using omega here and omega here, obviously. So, I have to choose in this solution the same a as this a and the same w as this w. And the only thing which I have to really think about is how to choose k, knowing that k is equal to what? t divided by mu omega square square root, right? From this formula. So all you need to do is to choose k, which satisfies this, if this is my initial condition. And that would be fine, because if x is equal to 0, x is equal to 0, that's the beginning of the rope, the one which I'm actually going with up and down. So if x is equal to 0, this function is equal exactly this, and that's my initial condition. OK. So we've got the wave equation, and we've got this particular condition on omega and k. I would like to spend some time to talk about what is omega over k. It's not such a simple thing, actually. It has a physical meaning of this. And you know what meaning is? It's the speed of propagation of the wave. That's something which was, well, unexpected for myself, to tell you the truth. But the um, derivation is really very, very easy. Now, think about this way. If this is the wave, okay? Now, let's talk about crest. Let's say the crest of the wave was at x, okay? Now, let's say that we are moving a little bit. The wave is moving. So, let's consider that the next wave is something like this. It's moving. You say, okay. So, this is x plus delta x. So, during the moment, during the time period of delta t, the crest actually moved from position x to position x plus delta x. All right? Now, If this is the maximum, it means that the function sine of omega t minus kx is equal to 1, right? That's what it means. Now, when we have moved, it means that the sine of omega t plus delta t minus k 
x plus delta x is also equal to 1, right? Which means they're equal among themselves. Now, what follows is the difference between them is equal to zero. <coughs> and now, considering um, they are very, very close to each other, the difference between signs I will basically um, approximate with the difference between arguments. Because you know that sine x divided by x as x goes to 0, it goes to 1. So they're very, very close to each other. Again, the difference is infinitesimal of higher order, which means that difference between them, omega uh, t plus delta t, minus k x plus delta x minus omega t minus k x goes to zero as delta x as delta t goes to zero that's what it means well if you will open the parentheses wt will cancel with this one wt cancel with this one so omega delta t minus k delta x goes to zero or delta x divided by delta t would be equal to not equal would go to uh, omega divided by k right These are approximately equal. <coughs> so delta x divided by delta t. Now, and what is delta x divided by delta t? That's the um, the length by which my um, crest has moved during the time delta t. So as delta t goes to zero, that would be speed distance divided by time. So the speed of the wave is exactly this. So what's interesting is that for the solution, this is equal to v square. And our wave equation can be rewritten as um, v squared times d to y of x t divided by d x two is equal to d to y x divided by d to square. <coughs> sometimes it's written this way. Sometimes it's written this way, which is the same thing. Also, another little nuance. Sometimes the solution which is suggested is this one. Sometimes suggested solution is slightly different. Kx minus omega t. It's just a different form because the difference is just a sign. Now, what's the difference between these two? Well, at time t is equal to zero, this is positive. I mean, close to zero. We go up, since this is positive. If times uh, goes from zero, uh, increasing from zero, this would be negative, where x is equal to zero in the beginning, which means my initial movement would be down. So it doesn't really matter whether I move this way or this way. Same thing. But solution would be, you know, it looks a, a little bit different, but, but everything else is exactly the same. Actually, this is probably more prevalent in, in the textbooks, which, which I have seen. What else? Um, 
Yes, this is very important thing. You see, whenever you are, um, um, but, but I would like actually to talk about the this formula. This is equal to v square. So, I think from the physical intu intuitive standpoint, the tense, the more tense the rope is, the faster um, the wave will propagate, right? I think it's kind of natural. Same thing, the heavier the rope is, the slower the speed of propagation of the wave is. So that's just physical sense of this. But that's very interesting and important formula. Okay, basically that's it I wanted to talk about. I did not touch the energy yet, because for energy we need something like this wave equation, we understand how the movements, etc. So next lecture would be about the energy um, of the rope, of the movements of the rope. Um, again, not yet about light. Light is much more difficult and and kind of advanced because vi uh, light is electromagnetic field oscillations. It's not as physical, not as tangible as let's say the rope. So that's why I started with rope. Anyway, that's it for today. Thank you very much. I suggest you to read the notes for this lecture. Um, it has basically all these calculations and you can just take a look at them yourself, maybe do it yourself, that would be nice. That's it, thank you very much and good luck. <laughs>